talk about is hyperglycemia. I, I do want to spend a bit of time on heart disease because um, there is an initiative coming for every baby New Zealand is screened with pulse oximetry. Every baby. And I want to talk about that. I know that's controversial. They do it in Australia. Yeah, I, I'm going to talk about that. They do it everywhere. Yeah, they do it everywhere except I was, Look, I was going to talk about... I was going to talk about examining hips and examining eyes of the newborn and, um, and a little bit of rashes. Um, but but, um, but, but I probably won't get onto a group B strep, which you know about anyway. All right, so, yeah, so look, that's the level that we get excited below. Um, just as an aside, there's evidence in preterm babies that if your sugar's high, that's also bad for you. Um, hyperglycemia. Is, uh, has a, a morbidity associated with it. So look there, are, I'll, I'll move over from that. Look, um, so why 2.6? This is gonna terrify you. Um, this is based on such weak evidence, but look, it's sort of trials that are, that are never gonna be repeated again. So the 2.6 is based on 17 children, only five neonates, and some of them actually had endocrine disorders, so they're actually having hyperglycemia um, uh, induced, not not on purpose, but accidentally, um, or having spontaneous hypos. Uh, and what they were doing, and, and what they did is they were looking at the latency between, they put these electrodes on their brains and looked at the latency between delivering a click in the baby's ears and seeing how the, um, how the brain responded to it. Um, so look, this is time zero here, and that's 20 seconds. So this is the time, the click happens there, and that's the time for the brain to actually register the click that was administered to the baby's brain. Um, and these, um, these are the normal glucose levels, 4.23. You can see there's a sort of a boing there, okay? So that's a boing, so the brain's hearing the click. At 2.3, the boing disappeared. That's it. That's the evidence. That's why 2.6 is the level that we now do. Um, uh, it is because there seem to be changes in brainwave uh, action if it dropped below that level. Now, it's not, that's not the only evidence. Um, there was also some other evidence from um, some uh, neurodevelopmental trials which were perhaps a little bit more robust, and this is from the United Kingdom. Um, so if there was a moderate level of hyperglycemia, that's the level that we've already talked about, um, if you had it um, recorded from five days onwards um, and then you had your 18 months, you were screened at 18 months of age, you had quite significant decrease in your mental or motor developmental scores and increased incidence of cerebral palsy. All right, so that's another little chunk of evidence that that glucose level below 2.6 should be, um, it might be a marker of, of problems. Now, if any of you had a glucose of 2.6 at the moment, you'd be on the floor there frothing at the mouth. I can tell you that now. So 2.6, babies tolerate lower sugar levels for reasons, well, we assume they do, for reasons that we don't quite understand, but 2.6 is pretty low. Um, all right, so that's, that's the evidence. Look, this is just, this is kind of similar. So this is um, a, a, a similar study. You see, they're, they're quite old. This is the days, th this is your mental index or your motor developmental index based on how many days you're hyperglycemic for. Okay, so that goes up to 15. So the message is that your chances of having low mental index or low motor index plummets the more you're hyperglycemic. All right, so that's, so it, to have a normal sugar is a good thing. All right. So why do we um, get concerned about hyperglycemia in the newborn? It's because it causes significant brain damage, and it seems to have a predilection towards the occipital lobes of the brain. So see, that's normal brain up there. See all that black? That's, that's damaged brain. So this is a baby that had prolonged uh, and profound uh, hyperglycemia. Um, what are the babies at risk? Um, Preterm, again, this is teaching how to suck eggs, diabetics, small for dates, um, and of course, this is, there's lots of ethnic differences there, which I've, I think I've mentioned on another slide, or very large. Can I say that at counties, that's not terribly large? <laughs> 4.5 kilos? Um, we've had to modify our protocols. I mean, I, um, we don't like sticking babies and doing glucose levels. Um, but, you know, so you need to have a you know, bend in the wind a little bit with your, with your guidelines. I think in perhaps Wellington or Timaru or something, 4.5 is quite large. Um, uh, right, and of course babies that are, um, th these are risk factors, but also need to have some pragmatism in looking at babies um, uh, that may be behaving abnormally, uh, developing sepsis, having low temperatures, they may also 
be having their sugars drop. Um, and then the ones that come out of left field, and this, this is, again, this is an MRI, those are the occipital lobes, that white is brain damage. This baby presented fitting to our emergency department at a few hours of age with a sugar of 0 0.9. Um, so that's um, ketone bodies, which is an alternative fuel for the brain. And by the way, lactate might also be an alternative fuel for the brain. That's another, that's another lecture. What do you think of that insulin level? The baby's got a sugar of 0 0.9. What do you think of that insulin level of 9? It should be 0. This is idiopathic hyperinsulinemia of the newborn. This is something we see quite a bit. It, it's, for, for some, this, is, this is different from babies that have a pituitary gland that's not working very well. It, it seems to take some babies a few days to get their glucose homeostasis system worked out. Um, and this is not a mother with gestational diabetes. This is not a mother with gestational diabetes. That's a, that, that could be the case here. But this is idiopathic hyperinsulinemia. The insulin levels are sky high. Um, when, of course, it should be zero. And the insulin is still driving uh, the sugar into cells um, and uh, the baby's profoundly hyperglycemic. That's a very, very low level. We don't know how long that was. Again, this was an early discharge and not feeding terribly well. N not that that was probably the problem here. That's the problem here. The insulin was uh, inappropriately high. Um, so just be aware of that. Frightening. Um, clinical signs. Oh, God. God, that annoys me, that one there. I mean, <laughs> jittery. I don't care. I mean, I really don't. Oh, I'm on film. It's, it's really, it, it, the, 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 look, this, I, yeah, I care about that. I care about that and mm, kind of care about that. That's a very nonspecific sign of, okay, maybe if, if there's some clinical background, um, uh, um, infant of a diabetic, small for day, it's not feeding well, maybe that should be paired with uh, a formal glucose testing. By the way, the glucocard card is very inaccurate, the lower the sugar is. Glucocard is very inaccurate. The lower the sugar is, if you have a sugar of 2.6, probably needs to be checked with a true blood glucose, if you can do that in, in, your, in your setting. Uh, glucocards are only screening tools. They're not a definitive glucose. Yeah. Um, all right, so, so basically the signs are specific, very non-specific. Um, all right, picture is gel. Middle way love picture is gel. Don't you? Yeah, all right. Um, because it keeps the baby with the mother, and I think that's great as well. Do I need to talk about dextrose gel? Are you sold on it? All right, well, I'll look, quickly going through. So these are the babies at risk, um, not, not, not the ones that are getting dextrose gel. They should have a sugar. Um, okay, so we're excited about glucose because of the reasons I've just... So look, we do have a very active management philosophy with these babies. So we, we check a sugar um, and um, we follow it until we get three levels that are normal. What's the evidence for three levels being normal and nothing's going to happen bad after that? None, but, you know... Mothers don't like their babies getting pricked all the time, and three seems to be reasonably good, assuming the f milk supply is still okay and the milk doesn't suddenly dry up. Um, all right, so that's that's fine. Uh, we discontinue the levels if they're fine, um, and don't worry about uh, the dextrose gel. Okay, so that's 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 the protocol that I've measured. We want the levels to be a greater than two point six. All right, so the dextrose gel treatment. Um, we're aiming to keep the baby with the mother and to avoid formula. I think you'll both agree that those are laudable, um, uh, laudable go goals. Um, and we're trying to keep the sugar within normal limits. All right, so this, uh, this is what we do. Um, oh, is, does everybody have access to this stuff? Um, I hope you've got your protocols worked out. That, you know, nursing staff are allowed to give it and yeah. you don't have to sort of jump through hoops and have people sign forms. Uh, oh, okay, well, I'm sure that'll come. Um, all right, so it's... 40 grams per 100 wheels, 40% dextrose gel. Draw up that dose, put it on your glove, rub it into the, the your mucosa, and then put the baby on the breast. Recheck it, your sugar after 30 minutes. If it's fine, go back to normal cares, but keep an eye on the sugar. If it's not, then repeat that step, do it again. All right, and if you get control, then normal cares. Um, and if it's still less than 2.6, then that's when you need to escalate care. Um, uh, an escalation of care probably starts to talk about guaranteeing feeds, i.e. formula or express breast milk, which of course is by far the, the best choice. Um, and other interventions like going to two hourly feeds to keep the gaps less, uh, and then, God forbid, into a unit and intravenous treatment in addition, uh, exclusively or in addition to oral feeding. So dextrose gel is very, very good. All right, that was, was going to be my halfway point. Um, it's not too sexist, is it? All right, okay. All right, heart examination. Um, 
again, a case history, um, and this is very South Auckland, 18-year-old Prima Gavita, uh, normal antenatal scan, normal doesn't mean normal. I don't know if you've seen these reports, I can't, um, large body habitus can't see the right ventricle, um, that's fine. Well, the reason they couldn't see the right ventricle because it wasn't there, all right? Um, so I get annoyed when that happens. Um, if you can't see it, get somebody, have another look and make sure it is there. Um, because if you can't see a vessel, it could be because it's not there. And that was the case in this case. Um, sorry, no, that wasn't the case in this case, that's another case. Um, all right, so she delivered at, Kurt, at term, had a LMC. Um, look, she was a primogravita and young. Mm, uh, it'd probably be nice to know that they were um, getting feeding a bit more established and in a hospital setting or a... Um, no, because um, uh, they want to go. I'm out of here. Uh, but that's fine. But look, she had a good LMC and um, so was discharged at 12 hours of age. Uh, midwife visit 36 hours, not feeding well, low temperature, brought to the emergency care department, pulse oximeter put on, SAT's only 40%, unreportable blood glucose. That's kind of a red herring. That's the most important thing there. That's secondary to that. Um, and um, look, this baby had uh, cyanotic heart disease um, but had taken a real hit. Those, uh, the SATs had been at 40% plus poor perfusion for, for, for probably hours and hours and hours, um, got multi-organ failure, perinatal dialysis, got its arterial switch, which of course is a second hit. Um, going on bypass is not good for you if you're a baby. It's a second hit um, and has cost a great deal of money, um, which probably is not something I'm here to argue. So look, cyanotic heart disease, uh, heart disease, despite all our screening, is still there um, and you can't rely on scans being normal, look, look I, and again, I, I'm, not, I'm teaching to the converted. So in your cardiac exam, what could be some flags for the fact that the baby um, might have some heart disease problems? I mean, there's family history. Uh, there's obvious things such as dysmorphology. Of course, Downs, 40% have heart disease. 40% have heart disease. Um, we'll talk about screening for this. Perfusion um, and pulses, uh, femorals, and probably not many of you would test brachials. Why, do we ha why are we so fixated with femoral pulses in the newborn? Coactation. coactation. When does coactations form? They form after a few days. They're never ever present in a newborn baby. <coughs> it forms after a few days. It's the, oh, I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, unless you've got an interrupted arch. All right, okay. Um, so, auscultate the heart uh, at the base of the heart, at the apex. That's where VSD murmurs rear to. Up here, that's the duct, supracavicular, and through to the back. And of course, a, a lot of the congenital heart lesions, the aorta goes over like that. You can hear lots of murmurs in the back. Back's a good place to listen to in the newborn. And I have to tell you, I used to um, play a, a sound of a murmur here because many of you hadn't heard murmurs, but of course you've got the internet now, you can just listen to murmurs all you like. Um, but murmurs in the newborn that are pathological tend to be high pitched, so you can hear them with the diaphragm. Uh, low pitched murmurs are not usually uh, problematic. Um, and um, uh, murmurs can be completely absent on day one, which I'll touch on later, but appear after day two, three, or four. So murmurs may be absent at birth, and you've still got major cyanotic heart disease. All right, now just to um, terrify, or just to kind of put a knife in what I've just said, <laughs> um, and look, I, the, you can be uh, brilliant at examining the newborn, um, um, but look, a, 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 a large majority of significant congenital heart disease um, you cannot detect with all those things I've just um, gone through, all right? Even when you've got a known syndrome that has a high incidence, uh, your um, clinical examination uh, may be ineffective. So just to flag that. Um, what are the problems there? Mild cyanosis is hard to detect, especially in some in some ethnic groups until they've completely and utterly um, uh, 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 their um, circulation is completely and utterly collapsed. Um, so ethnicity issues, perfusion issues, you have to have good lighting to ch choose. Babies in the night, on night shift, it, cyanotic heart disease is very rarely diagnosed at night. Yes. All right? And there's a reason for that. Because everybody cyanos at night. So that's, the, so that's, that's another factor. Um, all right, so look, we've also sort of said murmurs are often absent. Of course, murmurs have no correlation with actually what's going on underneath. 
Um, so that's uh, that's um, just adding to the adding to the confusion. All right. So the take-home message is that congenital heart disease uh, individual lesions are rare, but collectively it's common. And I'll just give you some New Zealand data on a, on a slide coming up. It's difficult to diagnose, and maybe maybe we should be able to screen for this. Look, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Elsa Cloetti, who's a neonatologist in Auckland, and she's the one that's behind this initiative for screening uh, babies for cyanotic heart disease, um, which I'm going to talk about in a little, a little bit of detail now um, to hopefully um, uh, gain your enthusiasm. All right, so here's a, here's a, um, a five-year New Zealand audit of, of major and critical uh, congenital heart disease. And the next slide, I'm just going to give you an incidence of those particular conditions. So this is, some heart problems are not that bad. What's the commonest congenital heart lesion? Do you know? It presents when you're 30 or 40. What's the congenital, what's the commonest congenital heart lesion? But it's bicuspid aortic valve. Yeah, yeah. And that presents with your, you know, suddenly at your insurance check, somebody hears a murmur and your, your bits of calcium are floating around. What's the next most commonest heart lesion, congenital heart lesion? It, this is the one that you, we'll talk about shortly, it's VSD. VSD, yeah, all right. So, but these are major congenital heart lesions. These are different from the ones I'm just talking about now. Um, so the major ones are defined that uh, will be associated with a cardiac death in the first year of life and critical as a cardiac death within the first month of life. All right, so those are the two definitions which you'll now see on the next slide. So here's the incidence. Now, these are, I'll talk about these things here. That's all major and that's critical. And these are the points of diagnosis. Now, you don't have nice colours on your thing there. But um, yellow is antenatal diagnosis, um, blue is pre-discharge, and um, uh, pink is post-discharge. Um, so 334 cases over that five-year period. Look, the take-home message, two cases per thousand, that's quite a lot. We have 60,000 deliveries in New Zealand a year, so, you know, that's um, 12. That's quite a lot of scrambled hearts delivering this country around the place. Um, and in two, that's the major, and of critical, it's 1.12 per thousand. So that's, there's quite a lot of, um, uh, of, of heart disease uh, out there. Um, so when are they diagnosed? Okay, antenatally for major, you know, 20% critical, a bit more, because critical, the, there's big problems with the heart, you, like the ventricle's missing, you, hopefully most scanners will not miss that. But look, the problem is, is the postnatal diagnosis, and that's why we're trying to cut that down, because the mortality for the postnatal um, uh, uh, diagnosis <coughs> is 27% versus 16 for those diagnosed antenatally or uh, at time of delivery. And while that's not only representing death, there's also the morbidity associated with it. Of course, that previous case I've just presented, that survived, but has taken a real hit from a neurological point of view. 18-year-old prima gravida <coughs> has a baby still tube feeding it couple of years of age, all right? So there's morbidity which is not documented uh, on this uh, right now. Um, just briefly about antenatal ultrasound, I'm, again I'm not probably, um, I'm talking to the converted here, it certainly has modest sensitivity and there's numerous factors that might, um, might uh, um, contribute to that. Um, you might not have a particularly good service or your service is not um, very experienced. Uh, I think in South Auckland, boy, some of those ultrasound people, they chuck them through. I think they get about a 20-minute <coughs> echo in the, uh, antenatal ultrasound and on to the next one. So look, there's, there's issues with that. Um, uh, so there's service delivery issues. And of course, service utilisation. It's um, what part of the country you're in. Do you have access to these services? <coughs> um, ethnicity, parity. I have... Um, it's very frustrating. Mothers have had six children and just they, they think, that we, I've done it before, everything's going to be fine this time. I mean, it, 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 issues like that. So I, again, I'm, um, I'm probably talking to the converted. And of course, um, if we have a, certainly an issue with large BMI mothers in South Auckland and we just can't see the baby with the scanner. So these, these are all issues, screening issues that means we can't actually see the baby all the time. So look, I'll just quickly go through some of the lesions that we're talking about. Um, so you can have a very, very bad heart in utero that manifests itself once you're born. And the reason for that is that the in utero situation, you've got two pumps in parallel. So you've got two pumps side by side. 
So you can have one of those pumps completely buggered and the other one's working, so it's fine. Baby's fine as a fetus. But once you are born because of the transitional circulation of various things closing and things opening, um, two pumps in parallel becomes two pumps in series. So if one of those pumps is buggered, it all turns to custard. All right, so that's why babies in utero uh, are fine with most congenital heart lesions, but once they're born, uh, as soon as the duct closes, which is usually the time point, and that closes, that can close quite fast. Um, anatomically, functionally closed by probably 72 hours. Anatomically closed a lot more, but functionally closed by at least 72 hours. Um, so the lesions are divided into two groups, and those two groups are subdivided uh, into uh, uh, other subgroups. So those that are blue and those that are pink, um, and of course it's that group there um, that are probably classed as the critical group and the ones that the screening tool that I'm going to touch on is probably <coughs> going to affect the most. So look, what I was going to do is quickly go through some of the lesions we're talking about. Now I'm not sure this is going to be fruitful. So look, I'll, I'll, I'll I, I, at the risk of boring you. Um, so anything that's sort of blocking blood going to the lungs is going to present uh, as a blue baby. So on these cartoons, the right, left-sided heart's normal and the right-sided heart is abnormal. So look, um, so primary atresia um, without a VSD, so the, 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 there's the pipe there that's normal from the right ventricle, so that um, the primary valve and the primary artery hasn't formed, so as soon as the duct closes, that's the only way that blood can get to the lungs. As soon as that closes, there's no way that blood can get to the lungs, all right? And really another manifest of manifestation of that is if the whole right ventricle hasn't formed, so that's, that's one form of cyanotic heart disease. And of course these babies are born, and on their chest x-rays their lungs are completely black because there's no blood going to them, all right? And of course the other one is, um, uh, so the previous babies, they're usually not breathless until they get very acidotic because their lungs aren't getting waterlogged with blood because there's no blood going to them. The other group of course is blue but breathless and that's the transposition of the great arteries. Um, and this is, um, so that's the primary artery coming off the right and the aorta coming off the left. They're around the wrong way in these babies there. And the only connection, again, is the ductus arteriosus between those two circulations. As soon as that closes, there's two circulations going in parallel with no connection with the other. Uh, and these babies present with lungs that are waterlogged. So they're breathless but blue. And the other ones are not breathless but blue until they become acidotic. So those are those, uh, two. And the treatment for those is to get that duct open and that's with prostaglandin, which can only be given intravenously. So that's the emergency treatment to try and save those babies. Um, right, I am going through this quite, quite fast. Look, um, coarctation of the aorta, uh, rare, often associated with a VSD, so that's normal there. So you can see the coarctation form there. Um, uh, it, it usually goes with other things. Um, and they usually go into heart failure after a few weeks' time. Now these are the ones where the femoral pulses will be disappearing. So you will be seeing these um, in your six-week check. They'll probably be presenting before six weeks with heart failure uh, as the left ventricle gives up and all the blood backs up into the lungs. Um, <coughs> and if they've got a VSD, they'll present after only a few days, which for reasons I won't go into. Um, all right, I'll slip through this. Um, I do want to talk about VSD. This is the most common congenital heart lesion. So this is, that's normal heart there. That's a hole between the two uh, ventricles. Um, and on day one, because the pulmonary pressures are still high, the pressure in the right ventricle and the pressure in the left ventricle will be the same. So there'll be no blood going across that gap, so there'll be no murmur. And as soon as the pulmonary pressures start to drop, which takes two or three days, the pressure there will drop there'll be a pressure difference between the left and the right and our blood will start to go across and you'll get the murmur. So on day one you'll have no murmur and then it'll start to appear and it'll be crashing. Now this is common, this lesion, um, which is why um, LMCs probably should be a little aware of it. And of course it presents at about six weeks of age when the um, shunt of blood going through the, basically blood's going through the lungs twice, um, the heart starts to balloon and the lungs, the lungs that's plethora, so that's heart failure. That's VSD. Um, so it's quite common. And the other thing is that it's, it runs in families. Um, so I don't know if you, when you're screening your mothers, ask about heart disease. Um, unsure. And I've already touched on those two factors there. Um, you have to have quite a big shunt 
before the baby actually goes into heart failure. So you can have quite a small VSD and the shunt's not big enough. It, has to, it usually has to be about five millimetres in size, which isn't that much really. Um, it has to be about five millimetres in size before the left or right shunt through it is a, of a sizable nature to, um, uh, to um, uh, start to cause heart failure at about uh, the third week of age. And uh, as a rule of thumb, well that's, uh, the VSD has to be about half the size of the aortic uh, diameter of the aortic root. That's a rule of thumb that poses significant VSD. All right, so how do these present? Well, look, um, the murmur may or may not be there. The bigger the VSD, the less likely there's a murmur, all right? Because you need turbulence to have a murmur, and if the thing's the size of a bus, then you'll get no turbulence. Um, all right, look, the first thing you'll see is breathlessness, and that'll manifest itself as feeding intolerance, which I'll talk about, oh, I'll talk about slowly, and to a lesser extent, vomiting and regurge. So look, um, again, I'm te talking to teaching out of Sarkeug. We've had some very good midwifery pickups of this lesion in South Auckland. Bloody good, <laughs> listening, just listening to the heart. And because murmurs can sound awfully like breath sounds, can't they? Um, uh, you just have to try and time them. All right, and more abundance when the whole left ventricle's missing, uh, and hopefully that'll be picked up antenatally. All right, so, um, I'll, and I'll move on from that. All right, so screening for cyanotic heart disease. Now, as that person in the back said, the rest of the world is doing it. Not all of Australia, by the way. Still problems, not all of Australia, but it's certainly um, parts of the United States, UK, which is where this has kind of come from, Scandinavia, who are enlightened, and Australia. Um, so what's the criteria for a screening test? Um, it should have an important health problem. Well, it gets a tick for that. Um, there's a good test for it. False oximetry screening is a valid test. Um, we've got a good treatment in place. Yeah, well, actually, you can treat it. It's, it's major surgery, but it can be treated. Um, and the benefits of the results of the screening and the benefits for the baby exceed the harm of the test itself. The, um, the psychological stress of a mother having a pulse oximeter put on, on the baby. Um, what are the unknowns in the New Zealand situation? Can our healthcare su system support it? Well, that's you guys out in the community with your pulse oximeters. Not that you have them. Um, can we support that? Well, that's an unknown at this stage. Um, is it socially or f uh, ethnically... Um, Feasible in New Zealand? Don't know yet. That's work in progress. Um, and um, is it in a New Zealand setting? Is there is there a cost benefit? Well, that's probably yet to be yet to be determined. But probably there would be for the reasons I stated on that case presentation. A lot of money's been spent on that case, and that baby's going to be uh, having a lot of money spent on it for years to come. So the tool for the screening is a pulse oximeter. Now, people familiar with pulse oximeters? The f okay, you've got a, uh, an admitter and a um, detector, so it, um, it screens the wavelength of haemoglobin and it um, adjusts its algorithm so that the, uh, the, the bluer the haemoglobin is, the, it converts it to a number. As soon as your sets below, set, drop below 70, most pulse oximeters aren't worth, the number's not worth anything. All right? It's only good for the sort of pinkish haemoglobins. The algorithm's not much good for... Um, uh, for, um, uh, for extremely desaturated babies. So this is the, <coughs> this is the proposed screen. This is basically repeated from what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, the test time is said to take only two to four minutes. Um, so we're asking that a pulse oximeter is put on a baby's foot between two, hour, two and 24 hours of age. I won't go into the details of why that time is suggested um, for babies greater than 35 weeks. All right. So if they've got sets greater than 95, finished, screen, go. All right. Nothing else to do. If their sets, are, well, if their sets are less than 90, all right, that's not normal. That needs to have a, 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 a decent review at that stage. So that's fine. If the sets are borderline, repeated after one to two hours, okay, that starts to become problematic because the mother wants to go home. Oh, I want to go home. It's two in the morning. Bloody blah, blah blah blah. Problem with that. If the next screen is still at that level, a third screen, um, and if it's finally come up, that's fine. If it's not, then that needs to be reviewed for cyanotic heart disease. And just to, this has been implemented at um, uh, at, Nash, at Auckland Hospital, and by chance, a transposition of the great arteries was diagnosed last week with this screening tool. All right, so I'm not making that up. And, and also Cloatia, the, that doctor was just thrilled and wanted me to tell you that. All right, so that missed antenatal screening with ultrasound. So it's picked up a TGA already. So that, that's excellent. Um, 
The, uh, the thing is that this screening tool not only detects um, heart disease, but it also, and the most common things it detects is actually developing respiratory problems. Uh, this is not increasing too much the load on echocardiography. It's actually picking up congenital pneumonia, uh, which is the vast majority of the pickups with this screening tool, uh, and uh, various other um, uh, uh, clinical conditions of, of less frequency. So it, it's, it, it's actually picking up mainly respiratory illnesses. And of course, um, picking up my great bugbear transient tachyne of the newborn secondary to elective caesarean sections. Well, I've already sort of moaned about that, so I won't go on about it. That's it. Cyanotic heart disease finished. Yeah. 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 The, the ducts closed enough at that two to 24 hour period that the sats, in, the sats will never be normal in those babies. They'll never be 100% saturated. So th they'll manifest themselves that early. Is, is that answering your question? Yeah, the other thing is just technical aspects of getting good sats on the Yeah. Because putting them on the 24 day old baby and um, the stride would have a night, we might remember that the age is in the baby actually have more sats and the colour and they were breeding. So the new baby actually Look, I haven't actually talked about that. That was uh, I could. This is a whole talk in itself, and and there are that is an issue, um, and there is also different. There, there are different pulse oximeters. Some are better than others in terms of their um, the, the, the 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 ability to screen out movement artifact and things like that. So look, it is, it is. It's not simple. It's not just whacking a pulse oximeter on a baby and magic, the, the, there's fiddling, yeah, all right, so look, I take what you're saying, but that's part of the problem, uh, and there has to be an element of training involved in this, all right. Okay, I'm moving on, rapidly, tongue tie, tongue tie, okay, I think tongue tie exists and is a real problem, all right, okay, I think tongue tie snipping is done far too much. Um, I think there, there is, um, there seems to be, it seems to be, I don't know, a fad um, at the moment, all right? But I think there are some babies for whom tongue tie is a real problem um, and, uh, um, and the, the mechanics of the shape of the particular mother's breast or the, um, the, the amount of protrusion or otherwise of the nipple in a situation like that is, the mechanics of that is not, never going to work, all right? Um, has this problem been examined with randomised controlled trials? Yes, it has. But th all those trials are very confounded by a number of things. One, they're all done when the babies are quite late in life, weeks of age, not in the... You want this fixed in the first week of life, don't we? We were trying to get breastfeeding established. And in all those randomised controlled trials, those uh, huge amounts of those babies randomised to not treatment eventually got the treatment. Do you hear what I'm saying? The, um, they, the mothers were in the trials, and, and once the trial was over, they, they, or the trial was coming to an end, they said, oh, actually, I want my baby's tongue to, tie to be snipped anyway. I want the treatment arm of the trial rather than the placebo arm. So those trials are very, very uh, problematic. So I think if you've got a very thin filamentous, uh, <coughs> um, uh, short frenulum like that that is uh, attached right to the end of the tongue, uh, and um, the, the tongue bowing like that, it's very easy to just quickly snip that and with some blunt dissection ba and, and dissect that back to the base of the tongue. And I think, I, I'm not sure where we're up to with the College of Midwives blessing this procedure. I think that's controversial. Maybe somebody in the room can enlighten me on that. But um, uh, I, we have um, a policy of reviewing these babies and, um, uh, and, uh, and some of them are in fact getting snipped and in a proportion of them, and not a great proportion, there seems to be some functional improvement afterwards. But we always pre-warn the mothers that the chances of this having absolutely no effect is greater than 50%. All right, so there are many, many un unanswered questions with the whole issue of tongue tie. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that the trials are, serious, uh, uh, are seriously flawed. Um, and which patients to snip? I mean, you're aware of the, the there are, there's the anterior tongue tie, posterior tongue tie, those classifications. There's the, 
the, the, the um, uh, assessment tools. Is it Halle Baker? I'm just trying, I just can't remember. Hazel Baker, forgive, forgive me, yeah. Um, there are various assessment tools. Um, and there are studies to try and validate those tools, but as with the RCTs, not all of them are, uh, are, are terribly strong in terms of their, uh, their design. So look, a lot of these issues um, are, um, are still um, are yet to be decided. Uh, and of course, the whole issue of the pre any procedure in a newborn is going to have a, an element of pain associated with it. Although it, the pain is usually from this tongue tie snip, it's from the holding the baby steady rather than the actual snip itself, because that piece of tissue is avascular and um, uh, and, in, uh, and is not innovated. So look, I think some babies benefit from tongue tie, um, large breast, short nipples, and that very short frame on that previous slide. I think that's worthy of an, a trial of tongue tie snip to see whether um, there's some improvement in feeding. Um, there is a growth industry among some practitioners of making a lot of money out of snipping tongue ties and of course the whole issue of lasering for the so-called posterior tongue tie is something that the ear, nose and throat surgeons, paediatric ear, nose and throat surgeons in Auckland are, are having a, um, are extremely concerned about because of some of the, um, uh, I, well I, it's, it's an emotive term but some of the butchering they've seen on some of these babies by lasering techniques. So um, I'm not sure if I'm talking to the what the mood of the audience is on this issue, but um, uh, I, I hope I'm placating you by saying I think there is a problem in some babies. It's an issue of which ones would benefit from it. And those very small filamentous ones are actually quite easy to do. Um, as long as you don't keep, I, I, look, just a snip and then blunt dissection with your finger, that little bit of filament will just part like that. You don't need to start snipping away, all right? Um, there was a North Shore hospital case where the scissors went too far and hit a big pumpy thing. All right, so that's, um, so I, I, that's, <laughs> all right. Again, I must remember I'm on film. All right. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is an issue for you, examining hips. Um, uh, it, it, it's got a new name. I'm sure you know it's got a new name. That's good because if you, miss, if you don't diagnose it at, at, at delivery, you can say, well, actually it developed after delivery, which some of them do. So you've got a, a get out of jail free card. All right, so, um, all right, one of those hips is dislocated, the right or the left? Hands up the right. Hands up the left. All right, okay. The, that hip is sitting in slight adduction. Okay, just to remind you of your, okay, that's a deduction, that's a deduction, okay, a deduction, a deduction. All right, okay. So there's um, a, a tribe of um, North American Indians that swaddle their babies in a deduction, and they have a high incidence of congenital dislocation of the hip, whereas African women swaddle the have the babies over their hips with the hips in a deduction, and they have a low incidence of congenital dislocation of the hip post delivery. All right. Um, Hip examination. Um, now I'll talk about this on the on, on the on the next slide. But of course, a deeper proximal hip um, cleft and buttock cleft asymmetry there is said to be uh, a sign of uh, hip dislocation on that particular side. Um, I'll talk about that shortly. So two types of uh, hip dislocation. It's probably that one there. Um, the classic one, uh, neurologically normal child, uh, relatively high incidence. Um, I, I, won't, I won't talk about that. Um, so what are the risk factors for um, hip dislocation? Um, oh. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm sorry, your pelvis is shaped differently from mine. So it, you're more, you've got shallower sockets. And also your sockets as a newborn baby are shallower anyway, so your joints can squeeze around being delivered, all right? And, if, and I think you all know about relax and all your ligaments are all lax as well. Um, positive family history, that's quite an important thing. I've talked about the, the hormones in the shallow sockets. Um, modesty forbids me to speculate on why the firstborn has a higher instance than um, mult, grand multips. Um, and of course, breach. Um, so the worst ones are those that have the, uh, so the uh, hips are flexed and the uh, knees extended. So the ones, the, oh dear, the ones with their um, feet up like that, all right, they're the, they're the ones. So if you have a 
female baby with a positive family history and extended leg breach, that needs to, that's a sitter for congenital dislocation of the hip. And that probably means to be sent for screening with an orthopedic department rather than just examining it and saying it's fine. All right. Um, all right. And I don't quite know why the left hip's more than the right. I think it's something to do with the uh, position that the babies have. Um, the, the, there's, um, one's, there's one cephalic presentation, there's a more likelihood of the back being to one side than the other or something. But I, I can't remember. I think it's something to do with the liver. But I'll, I'll move on. All right. So how do you examine these babies? Um, and I've already alluded to the fact that the, the dislocated hip will sit uh, in a slightly adducted uh, posture. So look, uh, uh, you've probably heard about these terms, the, the Barlow sign and the Ortolani sign. They're the, uh, don't, don't worry about the terms themselves. Um, the, um, and I'll talk about these, I think, on the next slide, uh, how, uh, what to actually feel when you're um, examining the baby. But just look, I just wanted to quite just, um, just comment that that slight adduction sign and also the hip creases sign, uh, those, those are very nonspecific. Um, I think it's worthy of you referring those if you're concerned about them, but they're a very non-specific sign that, uh, the, um, that the hip I is actually dislocated. Um, but they're written in the literature. They are present on some cases, so uh, we always mention them. All right, so how to do the hip examination. All right, so um, baby warm and quiet and relaxed on the parent's lap. I, look, I never do it on the parent's lap. Uh, I have it in the cot on, its, on the baby's back. Um, and I do one hip at a time, so I, I anchor the pelvis on the side I'm not examining, and then I examine the hip I am examining. You know, so I have the, um, the, the hip uh, slightly flexed and the knees flexed, and have my hand over the top of the knee, my fingers running down the thigh, and then I perform these two, maneuv two maneuvers. So gent gentle downward pressure uh, with the thigh in a deduction, and then gently abduct the hip. So that will relocate the hip as you abduct it, if it's dislocated. So in adduction, it's dislocated, and in abduction, it should clunk back into place. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever felt that clunk. It is a revolting feeling, and you'll never miss it. Um, you'll never miss a clunk. It's, a, it's, a, it's quite a pronounced uh, jolt as you're, as you're abducting, adducting, all right? Um, both. Both, yeah, it's going in and out. Um, so that's a full dislocation. If you're feeling excessive movement, that's probably also abnormal, so-called subluxation, as you're doing that manoeuvre. But if you're feeling nothing, then that's usually, uh, 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 that's usually okay. Um, a click. Look, a click um, is, th th this is often a, a referral reason that a, a hip click is felt. Look, this is often just ligaments flopping over each other. A click in itself is probably normal. Um, I look, I have to use the word probably. Two reasons. One, I'm on film. And secondly, it, it, you can actually have a click manifesting itself as a clunk. All right? So that's, that's, that's why I'm saying that. But a click is probably just little um, uh, fascia and tendons clicking over bony prominences. Um, the other important reason for screening for congenital dislocation of the hip is because the clinical signs of it, as the more time goes by, start to disappear. Uh, and it could be, con it could be uh, permanently in a dislocated state and it's not, it, it's, it's not going to manifest itself uh, as a clinical examination because the, the hip joint actually starts to mould its own little pseudoacetabulum in the wall of the pelvis, um, which is never normal. And of course they present with... Um, with uh, a dreadful hip problem very early in life. So that's the examination of the hips, which I think is something that um, uh, a, a number of staff feel uncertain about and, and, uh, and also somewhat fearful. Look, um, uh, they like to get the treatment on as early as possible, um, and uh, the treatment like to get on within six weeks of birth, and that's the treatment there. It may look awful, but um, it has a very good uh, percentage rate of resolution of the congenital dislocation of the hip. Basically, they, hit, they fix the hips in abduction, and that drives them into the proper socket, and the socket forms properly over that six-week period. All right. Um, so this is club foot. Now, babies in utero, of course, with um, their position in utero, the feet are in a kind of club foot position anyway. 
Um, and when they're born, the so-called positional talipes is easily distinguished from that, which is solid talipes equinovirus, by the fact that you cannot get those feet back to a neutral position. You can't get that back to uh, a, a, a point where that foot is in line with the, the lower leg, and you can't evert, you can't invert, you can't <coughs> dorsiflex, and you can't plosi plantar flex. Those joints will both be stiff, and that's true club foot. Positional talipes will have a full range of movement. All right. Um, Pacific Islander Māori people, I see bilateral club foot, I have no real, I don't go looking for other things. In Caucasian people, I see bilateral club foot, I start looking for other things, look at, close look at the lower spine uh, and other things. By the way, the fundamental problem with club foot is not the joint, it's the muscles of the inside of the leg. It's a primary neuromuscular problem. That's just a secondary manifestation of that. All right, I don't know if you've seen club foot people, they've got quite underdeveloped calves. It's a primary, uh, primary neuromuscular problem rather than a, th that's a secondary to a poorly developed um, uh, muscles that put the foot in the normal position. All right. Um, there's something else I was going to say about this. Uh, oh, you can have a positional talipes in the newborn, which seems to have a full range of movement, but it can evolve into a much stiffer joint over time. So part of your six-week check is to just keep your eye on those feet. They may, in fact, be starting to become a manifestation of true club foot over time. So even though a, a positional talipes may look okay in the newborn period, it can evolve into a club foot. That's unusual. All right. Look, the other manifestation that you might see in babies is when, not when they've had their feet in this position, is when they've had the foot so dorsiflexed that it's been shoved up against the anterior shin, and that's calconia, calconia valgus deformity. Um, and it looks like the, the upper part of the foot has a big sort of ding in it, a big concave. That is a benign lesion. Do you understand what I'm talking about? It's, it's, it's when, the, so it's, it's when the, the foot in utero has been slammed up against the tibia. So the, 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 um, uh, the dorsum of my foot there has been slammed up against the front of my leg in utero, right, by just positioning in utero. So that, and it, 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 the foot looks quite abnormal on the lateral part. It looks as though it's got a concave in it. Uh, there may be some decreased range of movement and some simple physio exercises make all you need to do with that, but that's a normal joint and normal neuromuscular. That comes right with time. All right.